Hello, this is David Farrell with another music theory video. In this video, we are going to be introducing you all to the ideas behind 12-tone serialism. It's a new musical approach for many people, and so we'll be going over some of the basic ideas behind it. A note, this video builds off of some of the ideas of set theory. I have three videos on set theory. If, you're not, if you haven't watched those or if you're not familiar with those ideas, I'm going to be referring to them a little bit here, so you might want to check those out first. So, as we often do, we'll start with some definitions. First, what is serialism? Uh, Twelve-tone serialism is a particular type of serialism, but what do we mean when we use that term, serialism? Serialism is a compositional approach focused on the idea of a series, and when we use that series, we're talking about an ordered sequence of musical elements. Series refers to an ordered sequence. This is a big part of it, things that happen in a particular order. The serial compositions are typically focused on manipulations of this ordered sequence. And when, what do we mean when we talk about uh, different musical elements? Well, we can use serial methods to control a lot of different ideas in music. We can have a particular series of pitches that we manipulate. We can have a series of different rhythmic values, of different dynamics, of di different articulations. All of these things have been used by composers uh, in serial music. And so what we'll typically find is an ordered series of one of those elements that sort of gets played around with throughout the piece. That's what we mean when we use the word serialism. Now, 12-tone serialism is a particular application of the serial method. 12-tone serialism is applied in particular to the pitch area. So 12-tone serialism doesn't have anything to do with rhythms or anything else. It's focused on pitch. 12-tone music is focused around a particular series of pitches, and when, again, when we use that word series, we note that it's a particular order of pitches. A series in a 12-tone work contains each of the 12 chromatic pitches exactly one time, hence the name 12-tone. We're going to have 12 pitches in a particular order, and that series of pitches will determine a lot of the sounds that we'll hear throughout a composition. A composer of a 12-tone work will typically use a number of different variations and manipulations on that ordered series to generate the pitch material for their music. A couple of things that we get from using the 12-tone system here in pitch. The 12-tone system allows composers to avoid emphasizing one pitch over another pitch should they desire. This avoids that whole idea of pitch centricity, of one note being more important than other notes. That is central to tonal music, to common practice music. Since our series uses each pitch only one time, the system makes it easy to have every pitch show up at about the same rate as the others. And this gives the music a very different harmonic feel than tonal music. We avoid having anybody seem so central and stable. And so the music can often have a much, much different harmonic vocabulary than Western music. At the same time, however, this, the focus on a series of intervals can be treated similarly to a chord progression or a motive that would be used in traditional music, in common practice Western music. And so the system allows for new harmonic language, but also allows for treatment that can be, though again it isn't always, but it can be a mirror towards traditional Western tonal music. This so allows composers to be new and innovative in some ways, to use a harmonic language that is unlike traditional music, but also to use some of the methods, such as variation and development and transformation of motive, that are very traditional and appear a lot in common practice music. Here we have notated a 12-tone row, a 12-pitch series, in which each pitch class appears exactly one time. In 12-tone music, we use the word row to refer to this particular series. We can see that I've notated my 12-tone row using conventional notation on the staff. I've also identified each pitch class which occurs. There are many, many, many strategies that one can use to create a row. Uh, I can't emphasize this enough. There isn't a particular single, single sound to serial music because how one creates the row determines what types of intervals and what types of musical sounds can occur in one's composition. I want to talk very briefly about one particular thing, which is the use of repeating interval patterns and segments in a row. So let's dig a little bit deeper 
into this particular 12-tone row. One common tactic when creating a 12-tone row that composers use is to repeat particular segments in different transpositions throughout the row. Not every row works this way, but this is a good starting point to take when analyzing a 12-tone row. Common segmentations are three, four, and six note groups because, of course, those divide into the 12 notes easily, and so we can have four three note groups, three four note groups, or two six note groups. If we take a closer look at the row that I created here, the row that I composed, we can see that it segments in a couple of interesting ways. This row divides into trichords, into three note groups that all have the same prime form. They're all 0, 1, 4, trichords with a half step, a minor third, and a major third in them. We can see that first three notes fit that category, the next three, the next three, and the next three. If we look a little bit deeper, we can also see that my row divides into hexachords that have the same prime form, 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 4. If I was going to compose a piece of music based off this row, I might emphasize these particular groupings in my music. The groupings of three notes, the trichords, and the groupings of six notes, the hexachords, if I wanted to have a greater uniformity of sound. Uh, that way I could have similar motivic or harmonic ideas showing up over and over again in my music. It could give some unity. Alternately, if I wanted something different, I might emphasize a different number of pitches. The four note groups in this row are all different, or other combinations like five notes, different groupings of two and three. So how a row can break down into smaller units can often determine its possibilities in a piece of music. Again, this is one way to look at a row. There are many ways to analyze rows. We're not going to get into all of them, but I think this is often a useful starting point when analyzing a 12-tone row. So what can we do with these 12 notes in a piece of music once we have them? Or if we're analyzing a piece of 12-tone 12, of 12 music, what should we be looking for? 12-tone music often uses the row in four different ways, four forms of the row. The prime form is the original version of the row, and you can see I've labeled it here, prime. I call it P5 because it starts on pitch class 5, F. I might find an, any number of transpositions of this prime form throughout a piece of music. Another row form that's commonly used is what we call the retrograde of the row. The retrograde takes the row and simply reverses the order of the pitches. You'll notice that my retrograde, written here, R5, starts on B flat, then moves to D, then to C sharp, and then to C. This mirrors the end of my prime form. My prime form ends on B-flat, then goes to D, then to C-sharp, then to C. The retrograde is simply the backwards form of the prime. Another common transformation is the inversion. The inversion takes the prime form, but has the intervals moving in the opposite direction. If we look at the prime form of the row, we can look at the first couple of intervals to get a sense of how this works. I move from F to F sharp, up a half step, from F sharp to A, up three semitones, and then I go down to G sharp and then down to, C, to G natural, down two semitones. The interval sequence is plus one, plus three, minus one, minus one. If we look at my inversion, I5, I start on F but I go down a half step to E rather than up to F sharp. Then I go down three semitones rather than up from E to C sharp. And then instead of going down two semitones, I go up two semitones from C sharp to D, from D to E flat. I've taken the same intervals, I've just switched the direction. The final row form is the retrograde inversion, which simply takes their inversion and moves it in reverse order. So my I5 starts uh, my I5 ends on C, G sharp, A, B flat. My RI5, my retrograde, begins with C, G sharp, A, B flat. These transformations might all appear in a particular piece of music, or only a small number of them might appear. They all sound somewhat different, but they're connected by having the same collection of intervals in them. And so the intervallic unity helps keep these, these row forms sounding similar, even though those intervals are manifested in slightly different ways. Sometimes they're flipped around in order, or sometimes the direction of the interval is flipped around, or sometimes both. These four row forms 
form the basis of a large majority of 12-tone music. The last thing we'll talk about today is the 12-tone matrix. This is a useful tool for interacting with 12-tone serial music, whether you're writing it or analyzing it. The matrix is a diagram, a 12 by 12 diagram, that displays all the different forms of a potential 12-tone row. How do we make this? Well, we start by writing our prime form of our row across the top of our diagram. And this is the row that I've been using, 5, 6, 9, 8, 7, 4, 3, 11, 0, 1, 2, 10. You can use letter names, should you like, though I think it's a little bit easier to use pitch class numbers, and so that's why I'm going to do it. By writing this row, I've written two forms already. I've written the prime form, if I read it left to right, and I'll call it P5, the prime form that starts on pitch class 5. I've also written the retrograde of that form, should I read it right to left. I'll call that R5, the retrograde of P5. What's the next step? The next step is to write the inversion of the row going down in the first column. And so I want to make sure all of my intervals move in a different direction. I started going up 1, then up 3, then down 1. So my inversion will start going down one, then down three, then up one. I'll label this going top to bottom as I5, the inversion of P5. I5 is 541, 236, 7, 11, 10, 9, 8, 0. And of course, I've also written RI5, the retrograde of I5, which I can read going from bottom to top. 0, 8, 9, 10, 11, 7, 6, 3, 2, 1, 4, 5. Once I have my prime and its inversion, I start adding transpositions. I like doing pitch classes here because it simply makes it a little bit of a math problem. And so I look at my prime form. The first interval is 5 up to 6 plus 1. And so I'm going to take every number in my first column and add 1 to it. So my 5 became a 6. Going down to the next number of I5, my 4 became a 5. My 1 became a 2, my 2 became a 3, my 3 became a 4, my 6 became a 7. If I do this right, every pitch class should show up exactly one time. After that, I'll move to the next column. In my prime form, the distance between the second pitch and the third pitch, 6 to 9, is plus 3. And so I'm going to add 3 to every number in the second column to create my third column. 6 plus 3 is 9, 5 plus 3 is 8. 2 plus 3 is 5, 3 plus 3 is 6, 4 plus 3 is 7, and all the way down. From my third column, I9, to my fourth column, I8, I went down by one semitone, minus 1. And so I'm going to subtract 1 from every number in my third column to create my fourth column. 9 minus 1 is 8. 8 minus 1 is 7. 5 minus 1 is 4. 6 minus 1 is 5, 7 minus 1 is 6, and so on. This is the real reason I love using pitch classes. It just makes this a lot faster when you can think of it as a simple arithmetic problem. Once you complete all the transpositions, you will have a completed matrix. Here it is. Isn't that lovely? Each row and each column should have each pitch class exactly one time, and if you did it right, the first number, your initial number in the top left corner, should appear in a diagonal line from top left to, top to right bottom. You can see that 5 threads its way diagonally through the entire matrix. This matrix gives me all the possibilities I could ask for in a particular 12-tone row. It's very useful when analyzing a piece of music. If you find a phrase that begins with the pitches E flat, B, and C, you might have a hard time figuring out without a matrix which row form is being used. But with the matrix, I can see very quickly that, oh, E flat, B, C, 3, 11, 0, that is probably going to be R, I, 8. I'll be looking for 1, 2, 10 right after that. If you see a phrase of music that begins with a, begins with 10, 2, and 1, with B flat, D, and D flat, again, you might have a hard time understanding how they found that, but with your matrix, all you have to do is look for that particular pattern, and we see it at R5, 10, 2, 1. 
This is the real use of the matrix. It makes it much, much, much easier to locate different interval sequences that might show up in a particular piece of 12-tone serial music. Some final notes about matrices. First, matrices can use traditional pitch notation, letter names, flats, and sharps, just as easily as they can use pitch class notation. I think there's some benefit to using pitch classes, but if you're very uncomfortable reading the numbers and you'd much rather look at letters, go ahead and write your matrix out that way. Another important note, when analyzing a particular composition using the 12-tone serial method uh, when writing a matrix, many traditional an analyses, and when I say traditional, I mean older, will set the first pitch of a composition using uh, that system as zero, and then refer to all the other rows as transpositions off of that. So for example, if a work started on G, for that work, they would call the row starting on G P0, and the row starting on A would be P2, and the row starting on B flat would be P3. Okay, uh, so if you see this, this is what's going on. However, modern analyses, many modern analyses, do not use this system. Instead, they use the standard pitch class notation for uh, pitches. And so regardless of uh, whether or not G is the first pitch or the millionth pitch, they'll always call G P7. Some different texts, some different analysts may prefer one method over the other. And so if you run into them, this is what's going on there. For me, I prefer using the numbers to refer to the pitches they always refer to. I don't think there's anything particularly special about the first appearance of a row that would make me uh, change my labeling system, but that's just me. What do I know? Okay, we did it. We made a video. We introduced the ideas behind 12-tone serialism. We talked about what it means. We talked about the row. We talked about the basic row transformations, prime, inversion, retrograde, and retrograde inversion. And we talked about building a matrix so that we could access all that information very easily. 12-tone serialism can yield so many different diverse results. 12-tone works can sound so very different depending on how the system is used and how the row is created. So please go into listening to these, these musics with an open mind and an open brain so you can understand what's going on and give that music the best listen or performance or teach or whatever you want to do with it that you possibly can. As always, let me know if you have questions. Otherwise, have a brilliant rest of your day, night, morning, whatever it is where you are. Bye-bye.